Hi everyone and welcome to our screencast on digestion. So before we start talking about all of the systems in the body we need to know and understand the difference between anatomy and physiology. Anatomy is the study of all of the different parts in your body whereas physiology is the study of the functions, the jobs, how all the parts of your body work together to get their jobs done. So what are the functions specifically of the digestive system? Well, there are five functions. First of all, we ingest or eat our food. We also do a lot of secretions in our digestive system. We secrete enzymes, bile, and hydrochloric acid. And then we use those to help to digest or break down our food. Now, we know that when we break anything down, when we're breaking the bonds between larger molecules to create smaller molecules or monomers, that's called catabolism, and it's also called hydrolysis. So we catabolize our food. We also then, once it's broken down, we absorb that food and we use it to make energy. And we also use it to help us grow and repair our bodies when they're damaged. And the last job our digestive system does is eliminate all of that food that we can't digest and we defecate it. So we ingest our food, we digest it, break it down with enzymes. Then we absorb those smaller molecules, those nutrients, into our bodies. Now the nutrients we're absorbing are, when we break proteins down, we absorb the amino acids. When we break carbs down, we absorb the simple sugars or monosaccharides like glucose, ribose, deoxyribose. And when DNA and RNA are broken down, they're broken down into nucleotides and that's what we absorb into our bodies. And when we digest lipids, fats, we digest or break them down into fatty acids and glycerol and absorb those into our bodies. And each of those different types of nutrients has a specific job in our body. And all of the food that we couldn't digest and get nutrients from, we eliminate. So let's talk about all the parts of the digestive system. First, we've got our salivary glands, and there are a number of different salivary glands that make our saliva. We've got our epiglottis which covers the trachea when we swallow our food so we don't get food into our lungs. We've got the esophagus, which is a 30 centimeter long tube, takes the food from the back of our throat to our stomach. Then we've got the stomach, which churns the food and starts the digestion of proteins. Then we've got our really long small intestines, which lead into our large intestines. Now the small intestines is where most of the digestion and absorption occurs in your body. And the large intestine is connected to the small intestine, and there are different parts of the large intestine and absorbing waters and salts. Then we've got our liver and our gallbladder, which is just tucked beneath behind the liver. And then you've got your pancreas, which you'll find tucked behind your stomach. And then you've got your rectum, which takes the undigested waste out of the body through the anus. So we're going to start today talking about the mouth. Now the mouth, obviously, is where the ingestion occurs, so we insert our food through our mouth. And this is where we begin two types of digestion. Mechanical digestion, just breaking big pieces of food into small pieces, and chemical digestion, breaking the bonds between larger molecules. Now in the mouth, the only chemical digestion that happens is the chemical digestion of starch. So let's talk more specifically about the mouth. What's in the mouth? You've got your teeth. You've got your salivary glands, and you've also got your tongue. So talk about the teeth first. Your teeth take in the food, and the teeth are what helps you to mechanically digest, rip those big pieces of food into smaller pieces of food so we're able to swallow them. So here you've got a big blob of food. Let's say it's a big chunk of potato. And what your teeth will do is they'll mechanically digest those into smaller chunks of potato. So there's no bonds being broken here, it's just physically ripping big pieces of food into smaller pieces of food, and that's mechanical digestion. You look at some of the teeth from other creatures, they're all slightly different depending on what type of a diet they eat. If you're a meat eater, you've got big, large canines, and if you're a herbivore, you can see with this goat, uh, you don't. So what else is in the mouth? Here are all of your salivary glands, and your salivary glands make the saliva. So here you can see one, two, three, four different salivary glands and they're all creating this saliva and if you look here you can see these ducts which take the saliva and they insert it into your mouth so what is the saliva actually doing well first of all it's liquefying your food it's making your food watery so you will able to swallow it 
and inside the saliva there's one enzyme. It's the, it's the first enzyme that starts to chemically digest food and this is amylase, or salivary amylase and what this chemical digestion is, is it's breaking the bonds between the starch molecules. So if you look at a molecule of starch which is just glucose chained together with a few side chains and what the salivary amylase does is it takes that cooked starch and it chops it up into maltose. Now maltose is one of those disaccharides that you're going to need to know a lot about. So what maltose is is two glucose molecules joined together. They are disaccharides. So cooked starch gets chopped up by amylase into maltose. The saliva also lubricates the food and it softens it and now we don't call it food anymore. By the time it moves to the back of the throat it's now called a bolus. And the last thing that the saliva does is there are, are lytic enzymes inside the saliva and they kill any most of the foreign bacteria that try to enter your mouth. This is a protection mechanism. So the saliva has a very important role in our bodies. The salivary amylase takes the cooked starch, chops it into maltose. If you look here closer at the mouth and you remove the tongue or you push your tongue to the back of your throat, you see these two little dots at the bottom of your mouth. Take a look and see if you can see that in the mirror. That, that's where the salivary ducts enter your mouth. So let's talk about our tongue now. Your tongue has three functions. The first of which is your tongue has taste buds and there are different taste buds on your tongue. At the very back of your tongue you've got bitter taste buds. Now this protects you against eating poisons because poisons usually taste bitter. And on the side of your tongue you've got sour and salty taste buds. And then at the very front, you've got sweet taste buds. So this gives you the, sens the sensation of tasting your foods. Your tongue also helps to move your food around. If you pay attention the next time you eat, you might notice that your tongue is constantly pushing your food towards your teeth so your teeth can then mechanically digest the food. It also mixes your food up with all of the saliva. And the last thing that your tongue does is it pushes the bolus, the chewed up food, to the back of your throat. And when it does that, it initiates the swallowing reflex. And that will initiate peristalsis and start to push that bolus down towards your stomach through the esophagus. So let's talk about your throat then. Your throat is called the pharynx. So when you see the word pharynx, think throat, the back of your throat. And the pharynx is an opening to both your digestive tract, the esophagus, and to the respiratory tract, your trachea. And what the pharynx does is it's got a reflex center and when the tongue pushes the bolus and puts it onto the reflex center, three things happen. First of all, the soft palate will push up and cover the opening to your nose so you're not constantly um, snorting food out your nose, although that is possible. And then the second thing that will happen is your epiglottis will cover your trachea so your food doesn't go down into your lungs, which again is possible if it's not working properly and then of course peristalsis is initiated and the food is physically squeezed down into the stomach. So if you watch here you'll see here the soft palate is covering up the nose so the hole to the nose is covered at the same time the epiglottis covers the trachea so food doesn't go down into your lungs and you don't choke. Here's a nice close picture of what an epiglottis actually looks like and this is what covers your trachea when you're swallowing. If you've ever choked before, you know what happens when it does not work properly. So let's next talk about the esophagus. The esophagus is about the size of a ruler. It's about 30 centimeters long. It's just a tube. There's no digestion happening here. It basically just connects your throat, your pharynx, to your stomach. And at the beginning of the stomach, there's a little sphincter called the cardiac sphincter. And what that does is it keeps food from going from the stomach back into the esophagus and re-entering the esophagus. So when you think cardiac, think heart, and you get heartburn at this part of your body. So it's the cardiac sphincter. Here it is here. So there's the cardiac sphincter. It connects the esophagus to the stomach and it carries the bolus into the stomach. If you look at the esophagus, this is a dissected esophagus. You can very clearly see the the muscular walls. This is this longitudinal muscle that goes all the way down your esophagus. And you can't see here, but there's also circular muscles. And when those two squeeze at different times, it pushes the food down to the stomach with peristalsis. Here's a dissected pig, and you can see very clearly the trachea. The esophagus is right under the trachea, and this is a, for reference where the spinal cord would be. Here is a picture of the esophagus and you can see it's squeezed tight. It will open up when the muscles start pushing the food through. 
So you can see here the bolus moving down the length of the esophagus towards the stomach. So the only function of the esophagus is to move the food from the throat to the stomach. And this muscular movement, this slow rhythmic contraction, that is an involuntary muscle that pushes the bolus along. And peristalsis doesn't just occur in the esophagus, it also occurs for the entire length of the digestive tract. So through the stomach, through the intestines, and all the way out of your body. You can see here the longitudinal muscles and the circular muscles, which help to create that slow muscular contraction. So when we get to the stomach and we go through that cardiac sphincter, the stomach is a J-shaped organ. It can normally hold about 2.3 liters of food, although when you really stuff yourself, you can hold about four liters of food. So two liters is at one milk jug size, so a little bit more than a milk jug is what your stomach would normally want to hold. When you're stuffing yourself with that turkey dinner, it can hold about two milk jugs of food and quit. In your stomach, there's an additional layer of muscle, the transverse muscles. You've got your longitudinal muscles, your circular muscles, and then your transverse muscles. And this just helps you to squeeze that food, and it will be squeezed in the stomach for about two hours before it continues along the digestive tract. You can see here, if you cut the stomach, there's the circular and the transverse muscles. So the stomach's one of its major functions is to churn that food and to liquefy it. That's all mechanical digestion, ripping big chunks of food apart. And this is helped because inside the stomach, if you turn the stomach inside out, there's ridges inside your stomach called rugae. And these ridges um, help just kind of grind the food. Here's a picture of a stomach that's been flipped, turned inside out, and you can very clearly see those rugae. And when one side of the stomach is relaxing, the other side is grinding and churning, and it kind of goes back and forth, back and forth. So what happens in the stomach? Well, there's three types of cells in your stomach that help with chemical digestion. One of those types of cells makes an enzyme that's not active. It's an inactive enzyme, and that is called pepsinogen. It doesn't work to digest anything because it's inactive. It's got chief cells, and the chief cells are making 3-molar hydrochloric acid, HCl, and that's getting dumped into the stomach. And then you've got mucus cells, and these make mucus, and this really thick layer of gooey mucus helps to protect the stomach lining from that very acidic pH. So what is in the gastric juices that get dumped into the stomach? You've got the inactive pepsinogen, it's an enzyme that's not activated yet. You've got your hydrochloric acid, and you've got your mucus. So three things contained in the gastric juices. The whole purpose of the hydrochloric acid is to take that inactive pepsinogen and activate it. Turn it into pepsin. Pepsin is an active enzyme, so hydrochloric acid activates pepsinogen. The hydrochloric acid creates a pH of about 2.5 in your stomach. This is what makes your stomach very acidic. And it gets released when proteins enter your stomach. And like I said, it transforms or activates pepsinogen into pepsin. And what that pepsin then does is now that it's an active enzyme, it will take that really large three-dimensional proteins that you eat in your food, like in a big steak, and it will chop them up into smaller proteins smaller polypeptides. So these smaller polypeptides are still pretty big when they leave your stomach. Now the problem with that is whenever you're stressed out your autonomic, your automatic nervous system will also kick in and you'll start releasing a lot of acids. And that's why when you're stressed out many people get ulcers. So here's a picture of an ulcer. It's just a hole in the stomach because your mucus isn't able to protect you and the, the acid actually eats a hole into your stomach. So your stomach will empty out after about four hours and bolus enters your stomach and when it's been sitting in that acid for four hours, it will leave the stomach as acidic chyme or acid chyme. And it, you'll leave the stomach through a different kind of sphincter called the pyloric sphincter. So you've got a cardiac sphincter entering the stomach and a pyloric sphincter leaving the stomach. And chyme leaves your stomach through this sphincter very slow and it's very controlled. Why? Because you don't want to dump a whole bunch of acid into your intestines all at once and also you want to give all that food lots of time to be digested in your intestines. So you release a little bit at a time. So make sure you come to class with all your heart questions about digestion.